said, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read verses uh, 12 and 13, says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men, shall, uh, uh, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And something I want to point out in this particular verse, a particular word is seducers. Seducers. Seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now what does this word seducers mean? It is a word that means imposters. Imposters. So imposters shall wax worse and worse. Saying that in the last days there are going to be people trying to imitate Christians, the born again, if you will. <coughs> but, but, they are simply seducers, trying to bring more people into their way of believing, their way of thinking, as opposed to the right way, which is in the Bible. Amen. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this chance to be here today. I ask that you lead this service, bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. We're here for that reason and no other. And Father, I just ask that you uh, open up the hearts of the people that are here today and let them hear the truth, Father. And let them understand through your divine spirit, Father, that it is true. And the decisions need to be made based on that truth in their lives. Lord, I ask you to be with night service. Bless it. And let all be done today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, when Paul wrote this, he was in prison. And he writes these verses. Now, I'm thinking about Paul sitting in a prison cell for what reason? Why was he there? What was his crime for being in prison? His crime was that he taught salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, the prince of the air, which is Satan, during that day, and during this very day that we're living in today, he finds that that should be a crime, that you would go out and teach salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, what does that tell us who are born again? That we have such an important message to go out to spread to the world that the devil's going to do everything he can to bring it down, to stop it, to kill it, to eliminate it, to do away with it. Our message is the most important message in this world today. Amen. There is no politician, no government, no laws, no anything that is more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ being taught to people around the world, our neighborhoods, our cities, our towns, our friends, and certainly our families. Amen? Amen. That's right. Now, the devil sees this, that it should be a great crime. And being that he is the prince of the air of the world today, he has very well made it such a thing. Did you know, for the past ten consecutive years in the world, there has been over a record 100,000 Christians killed a year. Oh a year. Folks, that's a whole lot of Christians. The reason is they're trying to spread the gospel in the areas of the world that they live in. Now, we talked a little bit in Sunday school this morning, Nathan did, about persecution of Christians. But folks, it's in a worst, I guess, area than it's ever been in the history of the world today. We think about the old days. And we think about the old times, how Christians was persecuted. But never in the history of the world has there been at least... 100,000 average per year for the past 10 years killed for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. To me, that's alarming. Now, what's this saying? That Satan finds it should be a crime to take souls from him that he normally would take to hell with him. And you ask yourself, why is it Satan wants to take souls so bad? Is there some sort of profit in him having souls to himself? Is he going to gain something for having souls for himself? No. Satan very well knows. There's no profit in him having souls. None at all. Nothing that he's going to gain. The only reason Satan wants to take souls from God is because it irritates and spites and hurts God so deeply. God loves you deeply. And he gave his son to die for your sins. And Satan knows if I want to spite God the way I do it, is take souls from him. Amen. And he will do anything and go to any measure to stop people from winning souls for Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, we're in a world today where we need to realize what Paul said. Amen. Paul instructs the born again that serving God is not for the faint spirit. That's right. For the weak. Amen. If you go out and you start winning souls, believe you me, Satan is going to attack you. 
He's going to do everything he can. He's going to mess up something in your family. Perhaps your job. Perhaps your, uh, he will lie on you. Perhaps your uh, testimony. Something to slow you down. But you just keep on keeping on for God. Ignoring him and letting God take care of Satan. And I promise you, you'll get through it. You'll get through it. So many times he tried to stop the Apostle Paul himself. You know, one of my favorite things about the teachings of Paul was when he was shipwrecked. And he reached down to grab a piece of wood. An old snake bit him, a viper it says. And I've seen that viper. It's a very deadly snake. And in fact, he should have been dead within about 10, 15 minutes. Now they stood there and watched the viper latch onto Paul's hand. And Paul just kept preaching and witnessing and telling them about Jesus Christ. They saw Paul shake the snake into the fire. That's where old serpent will go one day, into the fire. He shook it into the fire, and he kept preaching. Now, they estimate that Paul probably taught and preached that night for about three and a half, four hours. So see, Wednesday night was not that bad, was it? Amen. He preached for about three and a half, four hours. And he never fainted. When you're in God's will, the devil will throw things at you. The devil will try to slow you down. The devil will try to stop you. But God has the upper hand on the devil. And in God, you will be victorious. Do you hear me today? Amen? Amen? Now, but let's remember Paul, where he's writing this from. He's telling us that being a witness is not for the faint spirited and the weak. He's doing this from, remember, a prison cell. And he's instructing us by example. Example. Now, let's look at Paul's life. First off, we know that he was stoned twice. And folks, that evidently was something that God delivered him from. Because normally when you get stoned, you don't go really through it. And twice God got Paul through it just like he did the snake. It wasn't time for Paul to quit with the message of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul will live through this and Paul will go on another day to preach and to teach and to witness Jesus Christ. He was stoned twice, and evidently God delivered him through this stoning. The Bible doesn't say it. History doesn't tell us exactly how he was delivered, but he must have been delivered through these stonings. If you know anything about stonings, you do your research on it. Normally they'll take one rock and they'll hit you, and they'll try to break little like joints and bones that you can't move around too much with. Then they'll take a bigger bone, trying to break, I mean a bigger rock, trying to break a bigger bone like a uh, femur bone to keep you completely still. Until they bring a large stone over and drop it on your head and kill you. That's right. Now, Paul had to have been delivered by Christ on these two stones. But I'm sure he felt a lot of pain every time those big rocks would hit him in the head, and the back, and the chest, and the face, and the arms, and the legs. And these people throw him with just animosity and anger towards God. Wanting to take it all out on him. He made it. He lived through it. But then he was beaten. Once by rods, 39 lashes. You take a rod about as big around as my thumb. A long rod, probably about four foot long. And that's what they used on Paul. They didn't just beat him on the back. They beat him all over. Now this thing is made to whiplash and pop real hard. Wah pow, wah pow, wah pow, over and over and over again. Until flesh started coming off Paul. Bruises and blood. Just horrible. They had to stand there and withstand him. But then he was taken at a later day. And he was hitting with a whip 39 lashes. Taking hunks of meat off of him. Whipping him. Just tearing him apart. Why? Because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And no other reason, folks. He committed no other crime. Paul was a model citizen. He was an educated man. He knew a lot of things. He could help a lot of people in a lot of areas. But he dared to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was his crime and that was his punishments that I'm talking about. And then, Paul once was put in prison. But then again a second time. And they say it could have been up as many as four times. Locked up in prison. In one particular cell, he was locked up in for two solid years. Two years. Now can you imagine sitting in a little 10 by 7 stone room with no 
chance of getting out, and maybe occasionally a visitor that would speak down through a hole because you were down into a subterranean cell, speak down in a hole and holler at you. And that was a very rare occasion. Can you imagine trying to sleep on that stone floor? Folks, it would be hard. In fact, it was the deplorable conditions to a point where most people would have probably committed suicide just to escape it. It was horrible. He said, Brother Marty, how do you know it's so horrible? Well, first of all, being locked up would be horrible. Amen? Not having your feet or not being able to walk outside, breathe some fresh air, no matter if it's winter, summer, whenever it is, just look at the trees, the pine trees, and the grass, and just feel the air. It would be horrible to sit in a place for two years and not be able to do that. And know that you can't do it even if you wanted to do it. Your freedom is gone. You're locked up. You can't do a thing about it. There's guards there ready to kill you if you try. Two years. I know how bad it was because when we were in Rome last year or year before last, I saw that cell. I went down inside of it. And I noticed the conditions were horrible. First, it was very dark. It was a subterranean cell, which means basically it was underneath the ground. And I noticed when we walked down into that cell, that little old small cell, that again, everything was made of stone. Paul would lay on a little old tiny blanket, I mean, you know how thin a blanket is, every night for two years on that stone floor. Or he would sit up and sleep. Or he would walk around in circles on that cell. Now they allowed him occasionally, according to history, occasionally a lamp to write with. And these are some of the words that we read today that he wrote in that cell. Amen. But I noticed when I was going down in that cell, now they have created steps that go down into it so you can go to it. Now they got a ramp that you can walk on, but you can't actually go down into the parts where Paul was. Well, i got to admit it. I climbed over that rail and I went down in there. Because I wanted to see what Paul was going through. And I don't think God minded too much. I broke a little rule, but I got to see how Paul was what he went through. Mm -hmm. And I sat down for a minute. And I leaned against that rock and thought about that month after month after month after month what Paul went through. But when we were going down in there, I noticed that <coughs> the sides of stones were cold and clammy. It was damp. Now can you imagine sitting in a cold, damp environment on stone, no comforts at all for two solid years? <clears throat> Folks, get, really get this in your head. Then subterranean, as I mentioned, which meant during the rainy season, water would come down into that cell. It would probably stand in the floor about this deep, which meant <clears throat> week after week after week, more than likely, Paul had to sit up and sleep. He couldn't lay down. He did, he'd drink. He'd find a corner, perhaps, and sit on against the wall, sitting in cold ice water, trying to sleep. Again, his crime was preaching that Jesus was Lord. Amen. And salvation come through Jesus Christ. And that was his only crime. Folks, we suffer very little in this country. That's right. Amen. Very little. Amen. I have been over in Israel and preached in a church where some of the great preachers, Jack Hudson, Lee Robinson, others have preached. And while I was preaching a service, I preached something similar to what we had the Wednesday before last about Islam and its foundations. And there was a young girl there. And she heard the truth, I guess, for the first time in her life. And we went to the history of Islam and some things that she would have been familiar with. She raised her hand. She got saved that Sunday. Amen. She came to me after. And she said, you know, I got saved. But it's probably going to cost me my life that I'm ready. God calls me home, I'm ready. Still uneducated about Christianity, but knew something had happened in her heart once God saved her. She was forgiven. And she felt that pressure. On. I asked her, I said, how do you feel now? She said, I feel clean and I feel joy. Amen. And she said, but it'll probably cost me my life. But now I know, I know in whom I serve. Amen. Amen. Now a woman, Islamist woman, or Muslim woman, they got it rough, folks. That's right. They got it rough. And Teresa and I, when we see them walking around the grocery store, Harris Teeter, Walmart, <laughs> Food Line, or wherever, you'll see them in their, their habit, or their habit, okay? And you'll 
see them. And a lot of people fear them. They want to go near them. Man, them Islam, they're crazy. Them Muslims are crazy. Not us. We'll start talking to them about Jesus Christ. They're in our country. And we have a right to tell them about Jesus Christ. And we tell them about Jesus Christ. Now, they're not allowed to gaze upon men, as they call it. In other words, if they get caught me having a conversation with them, then they could get in serious trouble. So what I'll do, like we're standing in, uh, I don't know, say Walmart. She's looking at something on the counter. I'll stand beside her like this, telling her about Jesus. She does Jesus stuff. And she says, well, she'll get a little nervous and she'll walk down the aisle. And I'm like a you know, crab walking sideways. I'm going right with her. And he died for your sins. And he loves you and he cares for you. And you don't have to live this life. And it goes on all the way until I get the full message to her. And then I'll tell her at the very end, now you need to make a decision. You need to make a decision if you're going to follow Jesus Christ or if you're going to stay in that religion. In their country, I would be killed for that. Or at least put in prison at the minimum. But we're in this country. And what are we doing with this great freedom that God gave us? Amen. That's right. Are we going out? Are we telling these people? Don't fear them. Amen. Witness. Tell them about Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's our job. You know, when I was standing in that cell, <coughs> I realized the born again should realize, like a prisoner, who makes water. <coughs> Still fighting the cold here a little bit. <coughs> but I realized, like a prisoner, that we should realize that we have a constant reminder that life, a born again's life, is full of sacrifices. We can't always do as Christians what we want to do. We must sacrifice some things for God in order to carry out God's plan for our lives. We have to sacrifice sometimes. <clears throat> Going to the movies. Watching things on TV. Or not witnessing. We have to witness anyway. Have you ever felt that sensation come over you when... God tells you, tell this person about Christ. That sensation of that fear in your heart starts beating real quick. Oh no, what are they going to think when I start talking about Jesus? Mm -hmm. Now I can talk about Muhammad. I can talk about Buddha. I can talk about a lot of different religions. But if I mention Jesus Christ, Amen. all of a sudden my heart starts beating quick. And the devil's saying, shut up, shut up about him. Don't mention him. That tells me, folks, that's my evidence. That's my knowledge of knowing that I'm doing the right thing. The devil wouldn't fight it so hard if he didn't care so deeply about the results it could bring. That's right. Amen? Amen. Man. Verse 12. Paul tells us that we shall suffer persecution or be persecuted. Meaning, we shall be sought after and hate. That's what it means. To be persecuted means you're sought after and hate. People will hate you because you're a born again Christian. Our reward is coming, ladies and gentlemen. It's not to be expected here and now. Now is the time for sacrifices in your life to do the will of God in your life. But people will hate us. And we need to expect that. Because the message we have is so strong and so powerful. They want to do away with it. You know, I was looking on the news the other day. And there were some protesters. And this one protester always shows up just about at every protest, no matter what it's for. They'd be protesting uh, the whales or something. Whatever. You know, uh, Black Lives Matter. Whatever. And he'll show up. Homosexual rights. Whatever it is, he'll show up. And he's always got this sign. It says, when Jesus comes back, let's kill him again. This man can't stand the fact that Jesus is a real living God in this universe. He can't stand it. It irritates him. It bothers him. And he'll go wherever, do whatever he can do, any place, and carry this sign. If Jesus comes back, let's kill him again. He's devoted and committed to his cause. He travels all over the place to carry that sign and 
perform and put it in front of people. What are we doing? What are we doing? But he hates God. And it's obvious he hates God. And I assure you, if you confront him, he'll attack you like a demon, bro. More than likely. That's right. And then in San Francisco, every year, I want you to listen to this. They have a contest out on the streets of downtown San Francisco. The contest is called the Hunky Jesus Contest. And what they do, they put a crown of thorns, these gay men, homosexual men, gay is a word that means happy, so I call them homosexual, okay? Get used to that. <laughs> so they put this crown of thorns on their head and get up there, carry a cross across the stage naked. And then they flex and they pose and they pick a winner for the sexiest Jesus. Now we're sitting here and thinking about how horrible, how horrible this is. But these people are actively carrying this out with some kind of pride in their heart to do it. Such filthy mess. Such hate for Jesus Christ. Why is it that Christ roused so much hate in people who are not born again? Mm -hmm. Tell me, folks, why is it? It's a powerful name. It is the only name that will save a world from its sin. Amen. There is no other. And that is the only name that Satan totally wants to crucify, if you will. Hucky Jesus contest. And then one time I went with Teresa up to a meeting she was having in Raleigh. Her job carried her up there. It was a class or a meeting or something. And we were looking for a place to eat that night. I was riding around. And I saw several cars parked. And I was reading bumper stickers. I read bumper stickers. And just about every one of them had something slain to say about God. Lexus and big nice Cadillacs and Lincolns and stuff. You know, this academia elite, if you will, up around these colleges and all around Raleigh. And one had something that just stood in my mind forever since I read it. It said, I don't have to be born again. I was born right to start with. Just such mockery. Have you ever seen the symbol of Jesus, the fish, with the little legs under it? It says Darwin. Why is it? If they don't believe in God, why is it they feel they have to attack those that do? Right. Amen. I mean, really, what is your purpose? You know, you can tell me, uh, I believe in monkeys. You know, a monkey is my God. I worship Jojo the monkey. <laughs> I'm not going to try to spite you or argue with you. I'm just going to tell you, I think you... I mean, I'm not going to go out of my way and design things just to cut you down and spite you and be harmful to you. And they are the ones that preach so much about tolerance, are they not? We have to tolerance one another. Things have to be right. We have to have peace and harmony. And they're the first to attack the born-again Christians because of who we serve, folks, not because of you. It is because Jesus is their enemy. And the devil is in their hearts trying his best to destroy this image of Jesus Christ. He even makes us feel embarrassed to worship him uh -uh. and bring him up. This church ought to be full of people because of the gift that Jesus brought to this world. Amen. What an awesome sacrifice God made. His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. So Satan feels like I've got to up my game in these last days. I want to attack. But I'm going right for the throat <coughs> in these days. It's not going to be quiet little things hid in the corner and some brothel down the street somewhere, some bar. I'm going to be open with it. I'm going to attack the church itself. I'm going to try to destroy it in these last days because this is my last chance, my last hope of winning against God. He's attacked the church. The Bible tells us in church, uh, verse 13, the same chapter, seducers or imposters, imposters is what seducers mean. Imposters will what? Progress worse and worse. Paul is speaking about an attack in and on the church, the body of Christ. Imposters come into the church and we're seeing them all over the place. They're called mega churches. And we're seeing preachers preach messages that has nothing to do with salvation. They don't ever speak of hell. They don't ever speak about the condemnation of sin. They don't ever talk about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And they got 40 and 50 and 60,000 people in their congregations. Seducers is what they're called in the Bible. Seducers. Seducers.
seduced and being seduced is what it says in that verse. Imposters. You know them. All you got to do is turn TV on. And listen and try to connect how many times they say the blood of Jesus or speak of hell. When a preacher stops preaching on hell, he's no more good for God. If you can't get saved from hell, what are you getting saved from? Yes, God loves you. Yes, God proved He loves you. He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sin. We know God loves us. But there's another side of the story. God loves us enough to deliver us from hell. A real burning devil's hell exists. It's there and it's waiting for those who deny Jesus Christ. Seducers to come into the church. Go to verse 5, same chapter. <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 5. The Bible says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. From such, turn away. A form of godliness. Now you watch these Places on television, I call them places, I don't, I don't think I should call them church. And yes, it looks like a form of godliness, amen? <laughs> Y'all never watched one? Amen? amen. Thank you. <laughs> they look like a form of godliness. I mean, he stands up there, you know what I'm talking about, I got pretty hair to him, you know? God loves you so much. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Old Joe. But, he went on Larry King live and said, it ain't my place to tell anybody there's a hell. Mm. Then what is your job? To collect the millions of dollars that you're getting every year and having a good life, a good time? Sell out to the devil. He'll reward you. Mm -hmm. But you preach the hard gospel of the Bible. And Satan's going to attack you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Believe it, folks. It says they will turn away are we seeing evidence in these last days that they are turning away? What about the dress in church? Oh, uh oh, about the metal. You should dress modest when you go to church. Flat point blank. Now, not everybody wears a suit. Men, that's fine. But look good. Look good. Don't come in here with shorts on, showing your old, bony, ugly, hairy knees. <laughs> the Bible said, in church. Amen. Don't come in here with your little muscle man shirt on, showing everybody your big arms. They tell you, man, have time to be as big as you think. Bony anyway. <laughs> little. You know, I want to build a secret. I even go swimming in a shirt. I wear a shirt when I go swimming. Modest. Yes, God has a dress code for church. Read the Old Testament. Amen? Remember the priests? They would go in there, cover their elbows and their knees. That's what the Bible said. And if you didn't, they had little bells on the end of their, their garments, and they would ring those bells every now and If you ring your bells, God let you drop dead. You go in there undressed. You ain't right. You ain't what He told you to be when you went in there. Be modest. Show some respect for God. That's right. That's right. And stop being so casual. Towards God. The world has got too casual with God. Mm -hmm. Falling away. What about the music? Huh? Oh, yeah, you can yeah, crank up the guitars and the drums and the screaming and the hollering, and you can get probably five, six hundred people coming here right quick. But it don't lift God. Amen. The music we heard today is just perfect for church. Amen. I didn't hear one person get up here and sing one thing that was out of line. And it was good. Amen? Amen. I enjoyed it. And it prepared my heart to worship God. You don't need it. People jumping and screaming. Hallelujah! That's of the flesh. And it's for the flesh. And to the flesh. Music needs to be done. Respect. The message. 
God loves you, but there's also a devil's hell. And if you don't receive the gift of Jesus Christ, you will go there. Plain and simple. We can tidy it up. We can play around with the words a little bit. Just don't take, a, take the words out of the Bible and mix them up. But you can, you can, you can present it different ways, and preachers has to do, they have to do it. <coughs> but it has to be the hardcore message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not something to tickle people. Make them feel good. Mm -hmm. And open their wallets and throw money in there and go tell their friends, come on, you'll like this church. It ain't like other churches. Man, you wear what you want to you. The music, boy, you just sway with the music. Bet you ain't never going to step on your toes now. That's what I'm looking for. I'm going down there. And they're growing bigger, bigger, bigger. The message. What about the Bible? Well, we subscribe to this version Bible. I dare to tell you, I submit to you today, there is no Bible except King James Bible. Amen. Get mad at me if you want. I have done research and I know the foundation of the Bible. I know it. And I know that God has blessed the King James and called it His Word. And there is no other. Amen. Well, brother, what do I do with my ASV and my NIV? Use them for kindling. Amen. <laughs> Woo! What's going to go out across the world? Y'all know that. Good. Amen? Amen? And if you subscribe to any other Bible, go the way and buy your King James. If you can't find one, I'll get you one. I promise you. Folks, there's a great calling away. But there's still a small minority that will stay firmly with God. Look at verses 14 and 15. It says, but continue thou. Talking to the born again, Paul speaking to us. It says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. There is no other way. It is Christ Jesus. The devil will do everything he can to try to put seducers and attackers inside the church. But you've got to guard it. Don't let it pop its ugly, evil, wicked head up. Well, preacher, I think we need to get a little more liberal with our music. You better stop that that quick. I think we ought to at least look at other versions. You better stop it that quick. It ain't by my authority. It ain't by your authority. It's by God's authority that we do that. Amen. And we must stand by it. Until the very end. Born again, now is not the time to cave. Now is not the time to say we want a thousand people in our church so we're going to compromise. It's not time for that. We're in those last days. Amen? Jesus is coming, and God's promises will come with him. The church, Christ's body, has come too far and withstood too much pain to not go out in a blaze of glory. Mm -hmm. Blaze of glory. Oh, we're not perfect, but God has instructed us through the Bible, like Paul, to fight a good fight. And finish our course. Okay. And our course has not changed. It's the same as it was. If it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. Amen. It's the same that God has put it all alone. Amen. Paul's telling us, stay on that course. An old friend of mine, Jack Hudson, in his death, had witnessed a lot of people all his life. Won a lot of souls. And he knew this was his final trip to the hospital. He wasn't coming home. And he went into the hospital and started to befriend some of the nurses and doctors. He wanted them to see a kind person so they would hear the message that he was bringing. And every day he would witness to these nurses and these doctors. 
His son, Mark Hudson, and his wife, Joyce, decided one day they were going to go up there and visit him because the doctor called and said, well, it's not going to be much longer. The pastor's going to go to heaven. So they went up there to visit him. And when he went up there, he saw a nurse on the side of his bed receiving Jesus Christ as her Savior because Hudson had told her over and over and over again <coughs> to the point where she knew that she was lost and going to hell and received Jesus Christ as her Savior. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it Hudson was doing? What did he do? He died less than one hour after this. But what did Hudson do? He kicked the devil in the teeth one more time before he left this earth. That's our job. That's what we do. That's why we're here on this earth. That's why God has not yet taken us home. We are here to serve Him in the course that He has put before us according to the old King James Bible. Amen? Amen. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you need to recommit your life to God. You see how many people in the week? How many have you witnessed to? You need to witness to just about every one of them that you can witness to. There's time, witness to them. Again and again and again. Do like Paul done. God will protect you. It'll get hard sometimes, but you're doing God's will. And that's enough. Maybe you need to recommit yourself and come down. And say, God, I'm failing. I'm failing. I like to go to church on Sunday, and that's the highlight of my Christian life. Well, it shouldn't be that way, folks. The highlight of your Christian life should be the souls that you won last week. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, I wasn't sure about who to follow. But, brother, the Holy Spirit has revealed to me Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 